What's up fellow Embassians? I'm Dr. Zeb with another question walkthrough. Today we're going to review an important condition involving recurring neurological symptoms that you need to know for your board exams. You can follow along by clicking this link to the question. So let's check it out. We should start with reading the lead-in to figure out what the question is asking us to do. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in diagnosis? Okay, so we're going to have to come up with a hypothesis of the most likely diagnosis first. Normally, I like to see the sentence before it gives any confirmatory findings, but because I already know it doesn't, let's jump straight to the top to save some time. A 30-year-old woman comes to the physician for the evaluation of increasing weakness and numbness of the upper extremities for five days, so some motor and sensory dysfunction. During this time, she also has had urinary incontinence unrelated to sneezing or laughing. Okay. This is important to consider in combination with the other neurological symptoms as it could be due to autonomic dysfunction or nerve damage. She reports that last summer during a vacation in Mexico, she had weakness and numbness of her right lower extremity that was worse when she was outside. She regained her strength three weeks later. All right, this is what we're looking for. Does she have a history of similar events that had resolved? What is the main differential I should be thinking of with relapsing motor and sensory neurological symptoms involving different areas of the body and also urinary incontinence in a 30-year-old woman, especially if associated with warm weather? That's right, multiple sclerosis, so MS, a condition that causes symptoms of demyelination, axonal degeneration, and resulting conduction issues due to immune-mediated inflammation. In particular, the past exaggeration of neurological symptoms during her summer vacation could fit the so-called Udha phenomenon, which is a transient worsening of MS symptoms triggered by an increasing body temperature, as with, for example, hot weather, a warm bath, physical exertion, or fever. For Udha, think you hot. Got it? With that said, MS can be a tricky diagnosis, and there are a lot of differentials to keep in mind, such as neoplasms, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, vitamin B12 deficiency causing subacute combined degeneration, or infectious related etiologies like uh, neuroborreliosis, neurosyphilis, HIV encephalopathy, or PML. However, these are generally progressive and not associated with a remitting and relapsing course. Given their potential recurring nature, we should still consider, however, other causes of transverse myelitis, sarcoidosis, vasculitides, and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. And by the way, you can read all about these conditions and much more in AMBOSS for free for five days with the link in the description. So let's read further to solidify our hypothesis. She has no history of serious illness. She has had 10 male sexual partners in her lifetime and uses condoms inconsistently. Vital signs are within normal limits. Examination shows an impaired tandem gait. There is mild spasticity and muscle strength is decreased in both upper extremities. Deep tendon reflexes are four plus bilaterally, so enhanced with clonus. Abdominal reflex is absent. This is an early sign of MS that is seen in about 70% of patients. Muscle strength in the right lower extremity is mildly decreased. Sensation of vibration and fine touch is decreased over the upper extremities. All right. Given the complete remittance between exacerbation of symptoms that correspond to demyelating lesions in different locations throughout the pyramidal tracts, so weakness, spasticity, increased deep tendon reflexes, and impaired gait, the dorsal spinal column, so loss of vibration and fine touch, and the autonomic nervous system, so urinary incontinence, in this younger woman, relapsing remitting MS should be at the top of our differentials. Now, to answer the question, what is the next step in diagnosis? That's right. MRI, the brain and spine, is the imaging study of choice for diagnosing and setting a baseline for the monitoring of MS. We would expect to see multiple sclerotic plaques related to demyelination and reactive gliosis. These are most commonly found in the paraventricular white matter and are accompanied by finger-like radial extensions known as Dawson fingers. Since we reported symptoms from last summer, were not confirmed clinically to meet the revised McDonald criteria, and no, this has nothing to do with hamburgers, but it is roughly two episodes of central neurological symptoms that occurred 30 days or more apart and involved lesions in different regions of the CNS. An MRI, both with and without gadolinium, should be ordered to confirm the diagnosis. An MRI with gadolinium has the advantage of enhancing active lesions. With an explanation of the best answer covered, Let's check out the other options to briefly consider what we can learn to reinforce. 
As with many board questions, especially for step two and three, note that we can't completely rule out some of these differentials. The exam writers expect you to differentiate what is most likely. So they are essentially requiring you to make a clinical judgment call, which actually reflects what you have to do as a physician. Remember, especially for test purposes, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Or in other words, for diagnostic medicine, and especially for board exams, when you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras. But enough with the animal analogies. Sorry, I was just at the zoo last weekend with my kids, so. Serum vitamin B12 level would be obtained for suspected deficiency, which can cause demyelination of the spinal cord that manifests as subacute combined degeneration. This condition could explain many of this patient's symptoms, such as her sensory abnormalities, muscle spasticity and weakness, and impaired tendon gait and urinary incontinence. But symptoms of subacute combined degeneration are generally symmetrical and involve the legs more than the arms. This patient also doesn't have a history of a vegan diet or risky alcohol use or any other signs of vitamin B12 deficiency, such as fatigue, pallor, or glossitis related to megaloblastic anemia. Antinuclear antibody testing was a very good consideration as it screens for numerous rheumatic diseases, including systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, or Sjogren syndrome, which are important differentials of MS. Neurologic involvement is common in patients with SLE. However, the very common signs of SLE, including skin and joint involvement, are not present. Although SLE may manifest before the onset of other systemic symptoms, typical findings are cognitive dysfunction, strokes, seizures, and headaches, none of which are present in this patient. Sjogren's syndrome can manifest with a variety of focal and or diffuse neurological abnormalities. For example, impaired motor control, paresis, seizures, or peripheral neuropathy, making it an important differential. But this patient's primary symptoms became worse in the summer heat and demonstrated complete remission, which is not expected with Sjogren's syndrome. She also doesn't report any symptoms of gland destruction, such as dry eyes or mouth. In addition, most patients with CNS Sjogren's syndrome also have signs of peripheral vasculitis affecting the skin and muscles, such as ulcers or pain. However, in a clinical setting, if a diagnosis of MS was unclear, ANA testing may be considered. Rapid plasma reagent, or RPR, test is used to screen for syphilis, which is, of course, more common in individuals like this patient who don't always use barrier con contraception and can also manifest with neurological symptoms. A late stage of neurosyphilis, known as Tavis dorsalis, is also associated with sensory disturbances, impaired gait, and bladder dysfunction. But these findings typically occur about 20 years after primary infection, making it an unlikely diagnosis in this younger patient with no history of syphilis. In addition, Tavis dorsalis often presents with paresthesias and signs of lower motor neuron injury, including diminished deep tendon reflexes, the opposite of her exam finding. Early manifestations of neurosyphilis also include acute meningitis and ischemic stroke, neither of which are seen here. Electromyography, or EMG, can be helpful in diagnosing amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. While this patient has symptoms of upper motor neuron injury, again, she doesn't have signs of lower lower blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Again, she doesn't have signs of lower motor neuron injury like absent or diminished deep tendon reflexes, flaccid paralysis, uh, atrophy or fasciculations, which would be expected for ALS. Patients with ALS also don't experience symptom remission. We don't have time to cover all the differences between upper and lower motor neuron injury in more depth in this video, but it's very high yield, so I recommend checking them out in this AMBOSS table. Lumbar puncture was good to consider because it can help in diagnosing MS, but it's first indicated for suspected MS when an MRI is inconclusive. In patients with MS, the CFS analysis typically shows lymphocytic pleocytosis and oligoclonal bands. To get the most out of this question, let's continue with our reflective practice by briefly thinking about what other questions could we get for this vignette. The question writers could have asked for an expected finding, such as the multiple sclerotic plaques on MRI, or lymphocytic pleocytosis and oligoclonal bands in CSF analysis, as we just discussed. Had they given us confirmatory findings, they might have just gone with the first order question and asked the diagnosis of MS itself. Then they could have asked for the next best step of management, which would be, that's right, high dose glucocorticoids, such as methylprednisolone for the management of acute exacerbation. Should that fail, then plasmapheresis would be indicated. They might have asked what would help prevent this patient's exacerbations in terms of long-term management. In this case, there are a number of so-called disease-modifying drugs that could be correct, including the more high-yield ones, of interferon beta, uh, 
glatiramir acetate, and monoclonal antibodies such as natalizumab and ocrelizumab. Vitamin D supplementation may also be beneficial since MS is associated with low vitamin D levels and locations with less sunlight. Lastly, the vignette could have included many other clinical features like impaired vision due to optic neuritis, often the first manifestation, or internuclear ophthalmoplegia. You can strengthen your understanding of these details and many more high yield concepts in the Multiple Sclerosis AMBOSS article. So to recap, the key takeaways of this question are, suspect MS based on typical relapsing symptoms separated by time and space that correspond to demyelinating lesions in the pyramidal tracts, such as weakness, spasticity, increased deep tendon reflexes, and impaired gait. Uh, the dorsal spinal column, so loss of vibration and fine touch. And the autonomic nervous system, such as uh, urinary incontinence, especially in a woman of childbearing age. Also remember visual symptoms due to optic neuritis or internuclear ophthalmoplegia, as they are often the first manifestation. Know the diagnostic steps of MS, including confirming with MRI, often with gadolinium, which shows new and old white matter lesions in multiple areas. And that's it for this question walkthrough. Let me know with a thumbs up if you found it helpful and feel free to subscribe for more. Also check out any of the social media channels in the description for even more content. I wish you all good luck on your exams. Remember, hard work pays off, so keep it up and stay positive. You've got this.